Okay, so we're going to kick off our afternoon. It's one o'clock and I see three of our presenters and hopefully our fourth one will show up before too long. Um, and I have a joint statement from this group at, by way of an introduction and that I'm going to read to you. Some of our Southeast Kansas librarians have teamed up to develop programming for teens on Discord. They've come together today to share insights from their experiences and answer any questions you may have about starting a server on your own. So we're going to learn all about launching a team Discord server. And I will tell you that our presenters today are, and wave when I call your name. So Sabrina, you have to turn your camera on for just a minute. Um, we have Valida Cannon, wave Valida. And Valida is um, the assistant director and she handles children and teen services at Fort Scott Public Library. Did I cover everything that you do? Because I know you wear multiple hats there. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> then we also have Gina Lawrence. And Gina is the children's and a children's and teen librarian. And she shares the spotlight in Chanute with Candy Wilson. And Gina is um, going to help present today as well. And our, our cool chick of the day, I guess, is Sabrina Graham. Sabrina is the teen librarian at Parsons Public Library. And as you can tell, Sabrina likes techie type stuff and um, she's gonna help us present. And then Mandy, are you in the room? Maybe she's having trouble getting on. Not quite sure, but we will proceed without Mandy for the time being, um, just for the sake of time. Um, but welcome to all of our presenters. Thank you for being here. Thank you for agreeing to present. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Valida, who said that she is going to be the person who is doing the screen share today. Um, so go ahead, Valida. And also to remind you to put your name in your library in the chat box. And we always like it if you want to turn on your chat or your camera so that um, we have faces to look at. That, I'll hand it over to you and um, go put myself on mute. Thank you, Tammy. And hi, everybody. Yeah, she said I'm Valita Cannon and I'm just going to start us off today by speaking a bit about what Discord is, kind of familiarizing you with the terminology in case you're completely new to it, and also telling you some of why Discord is good for working with teens, especially in these present times. And I'm also going to talk a bit about the nuts and bolts of putting together a teen Discord server so you can make an informed decision on whether this might be right for your library. First of all, Discord is great because a lot of teens are already on it and it's a safe digital social space or at least ideally it is and you can make it so. And one of the great things about Discord is that it's very accessible for any teens who are connected to the internet and have access to electronics it's created to run in the background of games and not take a lot of bandwidth. So if teens have a slow internet connection, it still runs pretty well. And it can be um, accessed in an internet browser. It can be downloaded as an app to use on a laptop, a desktop, a mobile device. So there are a lot of different ways to use it and teens can take it anywhere, but ideally, Discord gives them a chance to reach out to other teens and connect from the safety of their own homes. And we all know how important that is right now. And within a collaborative program like we've created, it also allows them to reach out to teens from other communities and sort of broaden their specter of um, social connection while also maybe finding more teens from other communities who share the same interests they do and all of that in a safe space that's moderated by a teen librarian who cares about them. So 
So with that, I'm going to show you a few things that I suggest if you want to consider creating your own Discord server. And I'll put a little plug in. We are still inviting other librarians to join ours and be a part of our collaboration. So if you're in the Southeast Kansas area and you would like to consider joining us, we'd like to talk to you. All right, so let's say you do want to at least create your own server and see how it goes on your own. Well, first of all, you'll need a Discord account. And if you already have one and maybe your username isn't very librarian-ish, that's okay because you can change your Discord name within every server you're a part of to reflect that server. So across Discord, I'm Geek Mamacita, but within our group, I'm Miss Felita from Fort Scott. Now, I don't suggest if you're brand new to Discord that you dive right into creating your own server. I think you should join someone else's server and get a feel for Discord and what it can do for you and your library. So I suggest you join this group. You can see it on my screen. It's called Teen Librarians and it's packed full of teen librarians who are already on Discord, who are already doing Discord programs and who might have all the information you need to help you build the server and talk to your library board about it and be able to be more effective at this program. And as you can see, they do more than just Discord stuff. There are suggestions for programs of all kinds for teens, and it's a wonderful resource. So I highly su suggest or recommend that you ask them if you can be a part of it. And we have a resource sheet that we're sharing as part of this presentation. And there's a link to that Discord server within the sheet, and also to a Facebook group called Teen Librarians Using Discord which is also a great resource. And here on this screen, I show you a link to Teen Services Underground article, which has all step-by-step -step instructions on how to build a teen Discord server. So I'm not gonna try to take you through all that. They do a much better job. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about how we've created our server and some of the settings we've used and let you decide what you want to do. All right, so this is what our server looks like. This is most of our channels. And I'm gonna give you some comparisons to help you understand the terminology if you're new to Discord. So a server is essentially the equivalent of a website and it's highly customizable. You can change the settings and you can sort of make it your own. And by the way, I was gonna say this at the beginning, but we are leaving time in our presentation for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please write them down and save them. And at the end of our presentation, all four of us will, ideally all four of us, will answer them to the best of our ability. All right, and I'm always out there to answer your questions if you wanna email me later with something you think of. All right, so um, this is our server. We have what all Discord servers have. We have a moderator channel and we have a welcome and rules channel because there's always a place that everybody has to go when they first join. But after that, it's all up to you what you make of yours. And we have a number of different groupings of channels. And I'll tell you what a channel is. It's basically just a chat room, a themed chat room. And you can customize each chat room to allow members to do different things in them. You can allow them to do voice chat. You can allow them to do video chat. You can just allow them to type messages to each other. So it's up to you how you want to design it. Uh, we have some that are private. You can see there's some called library groups at the bottom left corner. And those are specifically for each of our libraries. So the only people who can see them are the moderators and the teens that we add to those channels. So Chanute Public Library's channel will just have people who are from Chanute and Gina can post things about her library's events in there or the teens can talk about things that are happening in their town and no other teens can see that. The Hangout Rooms and the other channels are all for everybody. So everybody can go in them, hang out, talk, play games, uh, Mandy actually created a scavenger hunt that branches through several of these channels and teens can go through different 
ones of them to try to find all the pieces of the scavenger hunt. So there's a lot you can do with channels, but that's just a little bit. Um, I actually got a lot of the inspiration for how to build this from a server I was a part of. So as I said, being a part of someone else's server can give you inspiration for your own. If you have a member who has Discord Nitro, which is basically the premium membership, they can do a, a server boost and that can unlock additional features in your server. So you might ask teens if they join, do you have Discord Nitro? Would you like to boost us? All right, and boosting doesn't cost them anything extra. So these are a few of the settings that we use and I wasn't going to go into a lot of detail about settings, but I will say don't be overwhelmed, especially if you're not very tech savvy. Discord can be um, <laughs> daunting if you aren't, but if you follow the step-by-step -step instructions and just do a few things, get the very basic of basic things done, such as what I have on my screen, um, then the rest of it will come over time. It doesn't all have to come to you at the same time. Um, on the left hand side I show you some of the roles and I'll go into more of that in a second. But on the right hand side is something really fun and anyway I think they're fun and that's custom emoji. In pretty much every Discord channel teens or anybody can react to messages with emoji and if you add custom emoji you can kind of make it easier for teens to express themselves and their fandoms and the things they like. We use the Minecraft heart a lot, but I've included a link in our resource sheet to the site I got our emoji from so you can look through it and see what might work for yours. Now this is a screenshot of the roles that we have and roles are basically titles assigned to members or that they can self assign that lets people know things like what library they're from or whether they're a teen or a volunteer or a librarian. We also have roles that say this is person is brand new or this person's a newbie. Or, this person, we call them big brains, is somebody who participates on the server a lot and has been here a while. Uh, you can do a lot with roles, but one of the things I like most about them is they let you speak to a specific group of people very easily. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you have five teens who are assigned the D&D role because they like Dungeons and Dragons. And let's say you want to invite them quickly to participate in a dungeon crawl. Instead of messaging everybody in your Discord server, you can just say at D&D, hey, I'm doing a dungeon crawl, want to join me? And your message will only pop up on the screens of those kids who are assigned that role. So it can be really helpful for targeting what you're saying. And we also have roles that have our library names, so we can see at a glance who belongs to what library. And if you decide to at least try out Discord, you should consider adding some bots to your server. Bots can help moderate, enhance your server, and I've linked to an article that has some suggestions for what bots to use. These are the three that we use currently, and I'm going to tell you why. Carlbot is great because it allows you, and you can see some screenshots on the right, allows you to do polls. So if you want to ask your teens, what program would you like to do next week? And you want to make it really easy for them to respond, then they can just use an emoji like a one, two, three emoji to vote for what they'd like to do next week. So Carlbot's great for polls and Carlbot has a lot of different games that teens can play and interact with it if you set it up that way. Um, the one in the middle, MEE6, is great for leveling people up automatically because teens tend to be competitive. So especially if you have some that are very introverted, MEE6 can help get them to interact with your server and chat with people and participate more if they want to level up. And it's automatic as they chat more, as they post more, then they get to higher and higher levels.
And then Dino is great because, well, I, I really like Dino, first of all, because you can rename it to whatever you want. So I renamed ours to the Amazing Bot Man. Most bots require you to have a premium membership in order to use that feature, but Dino doesn't. And we use it for moderation. We also use it to auto message our teams to remind them of our events. We have a meeting every Thursday night and Dino automatically sends a message that says, hey, remember we have an event at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday. So you can use it for a lot of different things. Uh, moderation is especially important if you're doing a Discord server program all by yourself and you need somebody to help keep an eye on language and you know, great things. A good bot can automatically detect that language. It can send people a warning saying, watch your language. And it can also mute them temporarily or even permanently if you need them to be muted until you go and look and see what's going on and talk to them personally. So there's a lot of potential for using bots. And I've linked to an article that can tell you a lot more about what they can do. And finally, I recommend if you decide to make your own teen Discord server that you incorporate other websites into it. So we've used Google Calendar and e a special email um, specifically for our group so that we can post the calendar for the teens to show us, show them what events we have coming up and they can communicate with all of us at once through the email. We also have a YouTube channel devoted to our group and there we can introduce ourselves in videos to the teens, show off our libraries, and we can also live stream from our dedicated YouTube channel or our Twitch channel, which also allows us to live stream games. So that's just a little bit about server building, and I'm gonna turn this over to Gina, and she's gonna tell you some more. Okay, so Valida, go ahead and go to the next slide. Maybe, okay, here we go. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about next is collaboration rules and policies. So for our server right now, we have decided that um, any librarian who wants their teams to participate, the librarian also needs to help participate in the moderation and the division of labor throughout the server and it doesn't sound nearly as intimidating as it does so if you're immediately like whoa i don't want to i don't want to have to do that i just want my teams to go to this it's not as hard as you think it is um so part of that is moderation as our groups kind of grow bigger and we get more and more teams kind of like what Belita was talking about with that bot is that sometimes teams might say inappropriate things and so we might ask a librarian like, hey, if you're not comfortable with doing programming and being on uh, doing like virtual programming, then maybe you would be more willing to do moderation type things. So making sure that teens are keeping their language clean, maybe interacting a little bit on the server and talking to them and kind of keep it going like that. Or maybe you really like doing kind of programming stuff. And so you maybe will want to do more programming stuff and leave the moderation to someone else. But since our server is a little small right now, everyone's kind of doing their little bit of part to make sure that the server is going. They're doing a little bit of moderation, a little bit of programming. Um, and the programming isn't really all that bad because I think sometimes when, when you think like virtual programming and online games, you know, you think of like YouTube and Twitch streamers who have these elaborate setups and things and they play like really big, uh, like multiplayer games and it's kind of intimidating, but, um, a lot of the programs we do are really small and it's mostly focused around our team groups. So it's not like outside people can come in and, and disrupt what we're doing. Um, sometimes we're not even playing like online games. We're just talking to each other or Sabrina is doing a D and D session and she's just talking to the teens and there's no online component at all. They're just talking to each other on discord. So that's kind of like what, how, We've split it up a little bit. Everyone takes a different week. And on the Google Calendar, we say what we're going to do if we have the forethought to remember to say, oh, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And then other times it's like, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but we're going to do something. So that's always fun. 
Um, we are inviting fellow librarians, library staff, volunteers, teen investors, board members, friends groups, anyone who wants to uh, help grow their teen base on the, on the virtual side. We're in encouraging you guys to come and join us. So then some registration recommendations we have. We have a Google Forms registration, and I just made a QR code that might make it easier for teens to uh, get to the form so that they can register because we've had a little bit of an issue with that. Um, and then we also have a document for parents. So one of the things that we were really concerned about was privacy of the teens and then if parents will even let their teens be a part of the Discord group because we weren't sure we could see issues where parents didn't agree for their kids to be part of this and they don't want their kids to be on a virtual network and then it could get an issue with us but then it also allows the parents to know what the expectations of their teens are. And so when you go onto the Google form, the teen has to read through the rules and agree to all of it. And it's pretty much the same thing as what you would expect for a teen to be in your physical library space. So be respectful of others. Don't be thrown around uh, slurs or bad language. Uh, respect, you know, respect each other, respect librarians keep things P, uh, PG, so no graphic content or anything like that. It's just a continuation of your library space, but in a virtual form. And then we require at least two contact methods for teens because they are teens. Sometimes uh, one contact method like email might not work. And so you need like a phone number to call them and say, hey, you registered on our Google form, but for some reason I can't add you to the Discord server because you didn't type your name out right. So can you tell me what your name is? That's happened before too. Um, rules and access requirements. Um, we have a couple of meetings when we were coming up with the rules, like if a teen um, used a bad word or something or, or posted something inappropriate, how many levels of, I guess, how many levels should they get past before we ban them completely? And so we came up with a, with a system where for the first offense, you're banned for 24 hours if what for whatever you said is is severe enough that we need to ban you for 24 hours. Then your second offense, no matter what happened, I mean, however long it's between your first and second, you get banned for a week. And then the third time is you're banned permanently, so you can't join back again. And then we kind of have some minor violation warnings where maybe they accidentally slip in a bad word and the bot catches it. So then we have an auto warning by Discord for the first offense, and then a second auto warning for, from Discord if they, if they do it again. And then your third offense is that you're muted on all Discord channels, and it might move into that more severe category where we might have to ban you for 24 hours. Um, and then the really important part of the access is to making sure that everyone, including library staff and teens, have the devices that will work with what you're wanting to do that night. So like, I know Minecraft is a huge deal for teens and, and for tweens, um, but a problem that we've run into is that some teens have Minecraft on their PlayStations and some teens have Minecraft on their old crummy laptop that doesn't work very good. And so it's kind of a balancing act trying to manage all the different technologies. So I think low key games really help with that kind of issue. So, you know, make sure that you have good equipment, make sure they have good equipment. You might need to remind them in their email, hey, we're doing something tonight. So you might need to charge up your laptop or your phone or whatever, because that's been an issue too. <laughs> uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. And so then uh, to market to teens, to tell them what we're going to do, we came up with a Discord server on Canva. I use a lot of uh, Canva designs and I think there's a link on our um, flyer to our Canva folder for the Discord team server. So I have a couple of different posters up. This is the most popular one, I think. It looks really cool and it's really eye-catching. Um, so you can print these out, put them in schools, event venues, churches, restaurants, social media, sporting events, local spaces that your teens go to. So like maybe coffee shops or uh, concert venues or something. Um, you can incentivize word of mouth marketing through your server privileges. So maybe you can create a role in Discord that's like, you know, Supreme Marketer or something, whatever, some funny name. So that way when it's kind of like a, 
if you recommend your friend, then you level up in Discord, kind of like those uh, mass media marketing techniques, like, oh, if you recommend a friend to this thing, we'll give you this, you know? Um, tell your tell the teen's parents about them, tell current patrons. If a teen walks in and they look about the right age, say, hey, we have a Discord server, do you wanna join? Um, and kind of tell them a little bit about it, have an elevator speech, kind of like, you know, normal things that you would do for your teen programs. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Just talk it up as much as you can. And then I think we will uh, pass it on to Sabrina. Hello. Um, I already said this. I'm obviously from Parsons Public Library and I wanted to talk a little bit about what we actually do on like when we host events and a lot of the reason I thought joining this would be good is because it's a slightly more um I can't come up with the word right now but it's less old people than zoom is for a lot of teens <laughs> and it's also some place that you can kind of build up a community so I thought it was a really good way to do some online programming while we were all kind of constricted to those kinds of things. Um, so, I mean, obviously you can have study groups, you can have, we've had people stream games and on our Twitch and this was on YouTube and they kind of listen to comments and react accordingly. Um, generally when I, whenever you run a program, you have to kind of put ahead of time, hey, I'm gonna be hanging out in this channel or whatever depending on what you're doing. Like tonight, I'm probably gonna do something related to anime because that's where my mind is right now. So I'll make sure to have the anime chat up and then tell them which voice chat to join if you want to talk to me or whatever. Um, it's also really important to listen to your teens and ask them what they want because if they don't want it, they're not gonna be there. <laughs> um, it would be a good place for like tutoring. So if somebody is struggling in school, you can have a place for that where kids can help each other or ask us questions, see what books we might have, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of collaborative online games as well. Um, one of the ones, I don't know how popular it still is at the moment, but Roblox and Among Us are a good, good examples of un online games that they might already be playing with friends on, or it may not be their school friends, but I know when I played online games, I had weird internet friends that I hung out with. So it would be a good place for book discussions because uh, there's obviously the voice chat aspect as well as it also does have the video chat aspect to it as well um and obviously role-playing games i believe gina did the new avatar rpg and last week i don't know how many kids showed up to that but and at my library specifically i run D D, &D or dungeons and dragons through an online thing like this because it's all theater of the mind you're just having a conversation where you are kind of, I lost the word again, <laughs> where you're just explaining a scene and they're telling you what they want to do and it gets a little wild sometimes and it's hilarious. So, and obviously there's multiple types of games and a lot of times if there's a fandom for it, there's an RPG in the works. So <laughs> go ahead and move on to the next one. So some other ideas that we kind of had. Um, one of the things that we've done at our library is Jackbox Games. And basically that is only one person needs to own it. And basically you can share your screen and they can see what's going on. And then they play on their phone or device or whatever. They just have to go to a website and put in like a little code. And that's pretty good. Um, you can share stories. So if you're doing like a scary stories or 
you know, it could be, you could probably even do like a poetry, um, be kind of a mic night, but it's like Slam. online. So you're doing snaps for people. Um, I believe that, was it? I think Mandy, oh my gosh, my brain today. She, um, yeah, Mandy, I believe did Board Game Arena. And it's a website where everybody, it's a free website to sign up for. I think there's obviously a, an age to it. So not everybody would be able to participate, but it has a whole bunch of interesting board games that you can play with a bunch of other people. Pokemon Go would be a fun one to do. Um, if you're just like having a walk and you want to start sending a bunch of messages around to each other, it could get interesting. That's so. And obviously we've talked about Minecraft that could be streamed or you could play together depending on who wants to be a part of that. And Among Us is obviously a big one, but I will always, every time I do a program is I make sure and send out a message ahead of time to the teams. I, cause you can specifically tag the teams. You can, so whatever group they're a part of, it just goes out to all those people in that group. And I say, Hey, I'm going to be hanging out in this room. Cause and you want to make sure it makes sense which room you're in. Like if I wanted to, since I want to do anime tonight, I don't want to do it in like the Among Us group because that would be weird. So, <laughs> but yeah, I enjoyed the Jackbox games. I think they went over pretty well in general, but there's a lot of those online resources. I know you can play Settlers of Catan online, but it's a lot of gaming from my experience but I could also I mean you could even hold like debates and it could get heated and kids like to fight so <laughs> um but yeah that's that's me um I don't think Mandy is here is she that is i have not seen her yet is is someone else able to cover her content from your group i can fumble my way through it if you guys want me i guess i'll try all right let me get back on here okay so obviously if the three of you i hope that you can just talk over each other and uh, yeah. fill in the gaps um, I hope Mandy's okay, but we're going to go ahead with the presentation. Okay. So obviously, if you're doing any kind of, of program for teens, you'll, you're going to have some challenges. And you can do a lot to tackle those challenges, including using your teens to help you be more effective. Um, if you have a teen who's hesitant to participate but interested in the program, you might see if they would like instead to be a volunteer and use them as an asset. Uh, you can poll your teens to see what they're interested in doing if you're having trouble with getting people interested in programs. And of course you can promote um, most effectively by word of mouth because once one teen who's got a lot of influence starts telling everybody how great your group is, you're a lot more likely to have participants. Um, of course, social media is a great way to advertise your program and promote it and when we were first putting this program together we discussed maybe talking to some audio visual groups in uh, local colleges or high schools and seeing if they could put together some type of presentation that might be more appealing to teens we haven't done that yet but it's something we are still considering so that's an idea if you're having trouble getting teens on your group you can always think about other solutions for marketing and flyers obviously are a great way to market it we have flyers at my library right now with a lot of different programs on them and of course our discord program is one of those and we put those in 
uh, patrons bags when they check out. So everybody gets a copy. You never know when you're going to um, give a flyer to maybe a grandparent who has a teenager that might be interested. So it's worth reaching out not just to your teens, but also to the adults who might be in their lives. Um, if you reward students who participate, like Gina said, by giving them special privileges in your server or leveling them up or giving them a special role or title, then that might give them enough incentive to want to do more. Mandy had a great idea a while back. She had uh, some things that she had extras of. I'm trying to remember what they were. Do you guys remember? It was something she offered as prizes to our teens if they participated in one of her activities and won. Anyway, if you have something like that that you want to offer as prizes that all incentivize your teens to participate. Um, let's see, bots can give them, give them level ups and bots can also self-assign roles. So we have a channel in our server that lets teens choose, like, for example, if they're artists or if they like TV and movies, they can choose that role for themselves just by responding to it's basically a poll with the emoji that goes with their role. So you can actually do that too, where you can just turn on an auto feature that lets them do things for themselves. And of course, send them reminders, not just inside your Discord server, but not all teens pay attention to your Discord server all the time. So you might want to send them reminders every week in Gmail. I actually use a plugin to my Gmail and uh, it helps me keep track of all that stuff and send auto reminders that I can set up weeks in advance. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. Oh, goodness. It's on the tip of my tongue, but it's not coming to me. Merge. It's Merge. Uh, you can use Merge with Gmail to set up auto um, reminders. And not all teens even check their email. So if you have them on another social media group, you can send messages to that as well. Uh, youth services may need to reach out to the parents of interested teens in order to get their parents' permission to participate. Sometimes you have to go the extra mile. I've had teens that I had to message in several different methods in order to get them to respond and participate and get all the stuff done so they could participate. And sometimes parents need reminded to get their teens back on the computer and and get them to their meetings. Um, sometimes you might have to help parents understand that there are benefits to a program like this because there are a lot of parents out there who don't really pay attention to what their teens do online and who just want them out of their hair. So especially teens like that, you might have to talk to the parents directly and you know, get them involved so that your teens actually remember to show up to meetings and they know why it's important. Um, grant opportunities to increase access could include trying to get your teens some um, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots. We have some at my library and not all teenagers have access to the internet. So you can apply for grants to get those Wi-Fi hotspots and check them out to your teens so they'll have access. This is also uh, a good way because I have some kids who live like 40 minutes away and it's a good way for them to be able to interact on a more regular basis as well. Mm -hmm. oh. Excellent point. Sorry, just a sec. I'm on. I'm <laughs> okay. uh, referring to. I think that's what she was saying. All right see coordinate the resources you have um so you can use like we've used uh kahoot trivia before and you can if you get your teens um cell phone numbers or their parent cell phone numbers you can text them or call them or use other uh, contact methods to get in touch with them and reach out to to your community partners. I've actually just spoken this week with my uh, high school's principal and assistant principal and asked them, could you promote this program? 
and I asked my public schools to put it in their bulletins and their newsletters, and they have been doing that. We got seven new teens out of just putting it in the middle school's bulletin. So that's a really effective way to reach them. And then let's see. I thought we had one more slide here, but I guess that is it. So I guess it's time for questions and answers. Anybody have a question? Let's see. I jotted down a couple of questions. Um, is it free to join and is it easy to sign up? Yes, to both of those. You can, as I said, do a premium membership, but you don't need one. And all of the other um, social media accounts we've made are also free. Okay. Um, do any of your libraries have equipment to check out beyond the mobile hotspots? So uh, updated laptop or tablets or anything uh, to that nature? And have you considered doing that? Not that I know of. <laughs> I do know that the Parsons School District gives out Chromebooks though, so. Yeah, our, our, our school district does to, too. Our, and they can do this from the school's equipment? Yeah. Sometimes they have it locked down so tight it's hard to know what you can do and what you can't. I have not tried it on my kids' laptops, but that's a good point. I could try it because they bring home their, their laptops from school every day. So, And obviously it's going to be different no matter what, like where you're from. It's going to be different. So, I have some teens who share their devices all amongst their family and they have a big family. So three of them might be on the same phone or, or tablet or something. And you might consider that if you're doing a game that requires everybody to participate. Like sometimes teens will have to team up if they're in the same family and using the same device, but. So we have yeah. a question from Patricia. Um, are the channels always active? Do you have cheating? So with, that's going back to the bots. Um, the channels are always active. They can always get on and send messages and do things. But the way that we monitor that kind of thing is with the bots. So we don't have to be there 24 seven watching yeah. every single message coming through. Yeah, we don't expect like for moderating librarians to be up at midnight, like watching your phone, mean, like, is someone going to text something bad? We don't expect that. But just, you know, like once a day, looking through Discord and making sure, you know, there's nothing inappropriate or anything. I will say it's important to make sure if you're setting up a teen Discord server that you change the settings because Discord tries to be as unintrusive on your life as it can be. So the auto settings are that you only get messages that are sent to a role that belongs to you, or if somebody ats everyone or pings everyone, then you see it, but otherwise it doesn't automatically alert you to messages. So you have to change that setting so that you see every message. Definitely go through all settings before you release a digital thing like this, because yes. it's very important to know what they can and can't see and do. And so, yeah. I'm just going to state the obvious, but this is not a one and done program. This is a way to connect um, with your teen population and have ongoing conversation and communication with them. Um, and I know that it's taken some time to build this channel in your Discord servers, uh, server. And so, uh, especially during the pandemic, I've encouraged this group not to give up, to um, stick with it for a while and see what happens after school is in session for a few months before they make any um, sudden decisions. And if anyone wants to try this, I would say give it a year at least before you say no one showed up. You know, of course, no one's going to show up for the first time. It's a new thing. You're new to it. They'll be new to it or not. Um, but, but 
make sure that you're giving it due diligence and don't just say, okay, I tried it. I'm done. Um, so do, does anyone want to sh- talk a little bit about your struggle to get people on and how that's going? Just, I think it's encouraging for other people to understand that um, even people who are in the know with the latest thing struggle sometimes. I, I kind of had a similar experience with that. So one of my uh, programs that I put on was I live streamed The Sims 4, which if you don't know, is like a life simulation game where you just play as like a little character and you get to control whatever they do. And there are different challenges that you can do in The Sims 4. And one of them is to kill as many other Sims as you can, which is when you're a teen, it's funny. You know, sometimes the way that Sims die is a bit ridiculous. And it's, it's kind of just like a fun, weird challenge that you can do. Um, and so I streamed it one time and I had a really good audience. I had a lot of participation. A lot of people were commenting on it and interacting. So I thought, well, okay, next time I do another, uh, discord program, I'll just continue. We'll continue killing Sims in the, in the Sims 4 and we'll see what, how many people we can kill this time. And I did it again and no one showed up. And so that was a little disheartening, but I mean, it was right around when school was getting started. It was the end of summer. So I was like, you know what? Teens are probably forgetful and they just forgot that that was a thing that we were going to do tonight. And that's fine. I might do another Sims 4 thing again. I might not. Who knows? It kind of depends on what I'm feeling. It's also fun because in, especially in Sims, there's a lot of like challenges, like online challenges that are actual set things that might be fun to do. Wow. Oh. Yeah, we've all had experiences where we didn't have someone show up and just sat there for two hours, but we roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the fact that we're doing this as a collaboration helps because we're there for each other. We don't just have to struggle through it alone and feel like, is anybody caring that we're doing this? You know, we're all there to support each other. So that's helped. I also wanted to say if you do set up a bot, it's very useful to um, create a dummy account and go in as that account so that you don't have moderator privileges because those override everything else and um, test it or have a teen volunteer test it by, you know, typing in some inappropriate things to see what the bot will do. And we did that and had to adjust some things. So it's really a good idea. Yeah, and it, it really helps to the more librarians we have to run the discord because since we have four people running it. So that means it's one night a month that I'm personally doing something like I might be sending out email reminders and telling kids who come into the library, hey, we're doing something on discord. But as far as actually planning an event and doing the work that that requires it's only once a month so next week is when we're going to do the avatar rpg which i'm really excited for so i've been kind of working on that and that's just one thing I, that i'm doing this month and then the next month is halloween it's october so we're i'm just going to do some spooky stories you know so it kind of depends memory. on <laughs> you're going to be fine uh so it, it kind of just you got to follow your passions a little bit when you do this because if you have a passion for something that you know teens also have a passion for then that's going to come through in the work you put through on the programs. Very true. Anyone else and have I, questions? Yeah. Feel free to take yourself off mute if you want to ask them anything. If you're confused, if you're like, how much time are you putting into this? Any of those questions, um, they're here and we have time for you to Ask away. How are you tracking statistics? So we have a a joint um, Google Sheet and it's attached to our registration. So, you know, how if you have a Google form that people fill out, then you can turn it into a Google Sheet that shows you all of the people who have signed up and all of their information. Well, we've added tabs to it. So each week when we have a program, then whoever's running it 
puts the usernames of all the participants into the Google Sheet for that week. And we count the weeks that we participate as hosts in the program for our own statistics. But that helps us also know how things went and who attended. We have a separate Google Sheet that that we're keeping track of all of our programs in, so we can also kind of remember later on what we did, what week, and how it went. Christine from Madison's asking, do you think smaller libraries with a single staff member could handle something like this? And I will say that Mandy, who was supposed to be here, and we don't know why she isn't, is a board member at, at Toronto, which is a one-person library. So does anyone else, um, I know each of you are not small one-person libraries, the three that are here today, but do you want to talk about your time commitment? I mean, we work as a team. So if you wanted to be a part of it, I think that we can delegate responsibilities in such a way that you can make it work if you want to offer something like this to your team. I think the, the longest time that I've spent on developing a program for a, a night that I'm running is probably this avatar RPG that I'll be having next week. But that's because I'm having to read the quick start manual and having to understand the rules and then be able to break it down for teams. The other things that I've done, like setting up a stream for The Sims 4, I already have The Sims 4 on my computer. And then on our handout, I have a link to a website called Streamlabs. And it's a, a thing that you can download to put on your computer or on your mobile device so that you can record whatever video game you're playing to YouTube or to Twitch. And that one took maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half to get it set up. And then once I downloaded it to my computer and got it set up, it didn't take anything to just pull up the, the streaming platform and then the game. And then we did it for however long that we did. Um, we, I have a, a thing with my director and my other children's librarian that on the nights that I'm hosting a game, I leave like an hour, hour and a half earlier to make up for the time that I'm going to be doing that night. So on the nights that you are hosting, you might say, hey, I need a volunteer or something, or we're going to have to close the library early tonight. Or maybe you're already closed, you know, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what your hours are, um, so we've made workarounds to allow myself to be able to do this. Many hands make light work and they're not going to expect you to know everything. And the good thing about trying something like this is the server's already set up. So you wouldn't have to do all the setup piece if you joined this group. You would have to learn a little bit about how it works and come up with programming that you would then present to the teens that are in this and the teens that you would be presenting to would be from hypothetically, if they all decide to participate that night from Chanute, from Fort Scott, from Toronto, from Parsons and from your library as well. So it's just this idea of getting teens to collaborate in a virtual space and um, sharing responsibilities among teen librarians for programming. More people that join in to help us, the less work we each individually have to do. So. Very cool. Thank you guys. That's, that's really cool. I, I see. Uh, uh, Lisa, yeah, Lisa yeah, from please. Iola said that video, it sounds, this, all of this is so intimidating to me. I just don't get gaming. The, the cool part no. about it is, is that you don't have to do gaming. Like the one I'm doing in October, is going to be stories. So I'm going to ask the teens, find your favorite creepy pasta story, which are like urban legends, made up urban legends. Find your favorite horror story that you've ever heard. Find your favorite spooky campfire ghost story you've ever heard. And we're all just going to sit around and we're going to tell these stories to each other. And I'm going to maybe check out a couple of the Alan Schwartz, the scary stories to tell in the dark. I'm going to read a couple of those and say, these are some of my favorites that I read. And we'll just kind of hang out and read stories to each other. So that's not like a video game that you have to play. You know, you can come up with different things that you can, you can do. Well, and I mean, you could also like do 
flashlight under your chin in a dark room. Yes, totally. I'm planning for it. <laughs> I, I, want, mean, like, I have spooky lights, everything. I'm so excited. <laughs> you could have like a book discussion over like Harry Potter. It doesn't have to be a game or anything. Just we did uh, trivia. We our first our very first thing was trivia with different pop cultures. So you could do like different like old movie type of trivia. You could do book trivia. You could do just history trivia. Whatever kind of you know trivia that you can think of. As someone who's written literally hundreds of trivias at this point. <laughs> It's not that hard to find trivia online, no yeah. matter what it is. So think of Discord not as a game. Think of it as a cooler Facebook where teens hang out. And more exclusive. Uh, okay, yeah. cooler and more exclusive <laughs> Facebook where teens hang out. So it's a controlled environment that they're meeting in um, for you to present programming, just like you would right here in zoom you're presenting i love that too that's good tammy <laughs> yeah yeah and that's why i kind of likened it to chat rooms because if you're as old as me then you remember what it was like in the beginning of the internet when everything was just chat rooms and we just talked to each other and you can do that if you want to for a discord program too you can do you know let's all tell a story to each other okay you tell the next part you know it's it's open to so many possibilities. I am so I down to tell my ghost stories. <laughs> I think the really cool one of the really cool things about this is it's not limited to just what I'm interested in or able to present or where my expertise is in. Gina has different expertise than I do, and and Valida has different expertise, and Sabrina has different expertise, and they're presenting things that my teens would never get because our interests and our expertise are in different areas. And so your teens then would be exposed to what Gina is, can offer, what Valida can offer, what Sabrina can offer. So you get the idea. Yes. And so we've had that happen with our teens too. We're, some are more interested in one week's program than another. And the more teens we get, the better that will be. Well, and so the if they wanted to try this, how would they, would they just email you? What would they do? Sabrina, I'm sorry, I interrupted you again. No, it's okay. <laughs> do you want to talk first, Sabrina, and then I'll, I'll answer that if you want. No, it's fine. Okay. I, I was just going to say, I have sort of a canned email that I've come up with, with all the basic info for getting started in our group. And I've already sent it out to a few people from a past youth forum meeting that said they were interested. And that's how we got Mandy on board. So if you are interested, then give me an, send me an email. I have some info in our um, resource sheet as well. But if also, if you want to look at our presentation again to follow any of it or review it, then that's available through our resource sheet as well. But there's my email address and I'll be happy to send you info. And don't be afraid to ask questions. We know it's kind of a totally new field for a lot of people. So we will answer questions if it would help you understand what's going on. 